<laughs> Hello. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Hurst. I am a professor at the University of Chicago in the Booth School of Business. Um, and I'm also director of the University of Chicago's Becker Friedman Institute. And so on behalf of the Becker Friedman Institute, the World Bank, and uh, our generous host, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, I would like to welcome you all to this very special event tonight. Before I invite our presenter to the stage, I just want to give a quick word about the Becker Friedman uh, Institute at the University of Chicago, or as we call it, BFI. Uh, BFI's slogan is Frontier Research and Global Impact, and it's a great summation of, uh, of our mission. So BFI at Chicago is the hub of all economics research, and it kind of spans the umbrella of the Booth School, the Ken Griffin Department of Economics, the Harris School of Public Policy, and the University of Chicago Law School. And so our job is to promote and support frontier research, but importantly, we work hard to deliver on the output of that research to key stakeholders like yourselves. And so what we're doing tonight, in part, is a continuation of our mission. And so in partnership with the World Bank, um, we're going to be uh, having our uh, event tonight. And so BFI supports more than a dozen research in initiatives and programs ranging from such issues as labor markets, health economics, social economics, as well as uh, issues related to economic development uh, around the world. And we are hopeful that tonight's event is the beginning of a long, uh, fruitful relationship uh, between BFI and, and the World Bank and the University of Chicago writ large. So at this point, Again, it's time for me to get out of the way and introduce our, our speaker tonight. So I'd like to turn things over to Indermit Gill, World Bank Chief Economist and Senior Vice President for Development Economics. Indermit has been a leader in the field of development economics during his career at the World Bank, including his leadership of the bank's influential 2009 World Development Report on Economic Geography. This evening, we will hear all about the bank's exciting new report on economic development of middle-income countries and the role of creative destruction in growth. Inderman has taught at Duke, Georgetown, and most importantly at the University of Chicago, where we are proud to say that he received his PhD in economics a few years ago. <laughs> Inderman, the stage is yours. He's going to come out of that room in a second. Let's all welcome him to the stage right now. Thank you very much for that very nice introduction, especially nice because you didn't say which year I graduated. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. You tell us. <laughs> well, I can tell you, uh, so I spent, I spent five, uh, I spent, uh, I guess it was four and a half really rough years at Chicago, but I do sort of look back upon those fondly. What I have only 15 minutes to, to, to actually introduce the report to you. Uh, so I'll give you a quick introduction about what the World Development Report is, and then I'll tell you ab about the one that we are doing right now. So we, uh, the, the World Bank puts out an annual report, it's called the World Development Report, uh, and it's about some particular issue that we think is of concern to the world, especially to the developing part of the world. And we've been doing this since 1978, right? And uh, um, now, uh, th those of you who actually know the World Development Report may not know this one thing, which is that the World Development Report used to have three sections. So it, the first section that it had was called Global Economic Prospects. And that would tell, uh, that, that, that would essentially be a summary of where the world was at that point. The second part of the report was a special topic, right? It could be something to do with climate or it could be do it, I think. And then the third part was something that was called the World Development Indicators, right? So over time, as the World Bank has grown, uh, these, uh, three, these three sections have actually each become a report. So we have something called the Global Economic Prospects Report, then we have the World Development Report, and then we have another set of indicators that we call the World Development Indicators, the WDI. So the story I want to tell you was one uh, b back when I was doing the World Development Report 2008, um, Bob Lucas came to town. So he actually came to give a talk at, um, at, at the, the, the World Bank. And in between his lunch 
And his lecture, he had some time, so I gave him my office, right? So uh, when it came time for him to start, uh, to, to actually to, to uh, uh, take him to the lecture hall, uh, I saw him scrolling through my computer, all right? I mean, <laughs> so he said, I, he, he actually turns to me and he says, so we had just finished the first draft of our report. And he said, wow, Indomie, this is really cool stuff. I was like, so happy to hear, the, you know, that, that Bob said this really cool stuff. So I asked him, I said, uh, so which part of the report do you like? Do you like the facts part or the, uh, the, the, the analysis part or the policy part? So he said, no, 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 all that stuff is all World Bank, um, World Bank mumbo jumbo as a thing. He said, what I really like is the World Development Indicator section because we still have a small section there. Please, can I have that? Right. So we still have that small section in there. But what I'm going to tell you about today is the World Bank propaganda stuff. Okay. Um, okay. Now, uh, so, um, so the uh, the 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 uh, the, 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 the the uh, report is about middle-income economies, right? And so just to tell you about what these middle-income economies are. Uh, so broadly speaking, these are the parts of the world that are developing, but they have developed to an extent that their futures are actually pretty linked with the futures of developed economies, right? Uh, so uh, these are not uh, the, the, these are countries that have very close economic relations with the advanced economies of the world, right? But they're a very important lot right now. So if you look at this chart over here, you'll see that that uh, that we have about about a hundred uh, about a hundred middle-income countries, right? And these hundred are split uh, into like sixty and forty or so. Uh, those that we call lower middle income economies, and those that we call upper middle income countries, right? So lower middle income economies are those that have per capita incomes between about a thousand dollars per capita to about five thousand, and then upper middle income countries are those that have between five thousand and around twelve thousand five hundred. Okay. Um, but the main point is that their futures are actually pretty linked with the futures of advanced economies, right? Now, they're a sizable lot, as you can so sort of see. They're, they're probably the most important group of countries in the world today in terms of, in terms of what's happening around the world. Uh, and so you see that they are about 75% about, uh, about of the world's population, uh, about 40% of the world's output, GDP, uh, about uh, actually close to 60% of the world's extreme poverty. So, uh, so, so actually a large number of poor people still live there. And about, uh, I guess about 60%, 65% of the world's CO2 emissions. So if you care about any of these things, you should be caring about these countries. Right? Now, if you care about these countries, the thing that is happening in these countries is that it does not it does it does seem that they are actually in trouble okay and i'll tell you a little bit about why uh, but just one measure of this is the rate of growth of these countries economies right so if you look at these countries uh, during the first decade of this millennium they grew at around six percent a year okay if you look at the 2010s that dropped to 5%. And if you look at uh, the rates of growth, expected rates of growth in this decade, it's around 4%. Okay. Now, only part of this is because of the slowdown in China. Actually, China's slowdown has been even faster. China has slowed down from about 9% in the first decade to around 7% in the second, and only to about 5% uh, uh, during the 2020s. So China is still actually growing faster than the average of these middle-income countries as a whole, right? That's one thing. The other thing that's happening to them are internal changes. And there are two or three big ones. One is, of course, is that they, they are aging very fast. So, so uh, they are growing slower and they are aging faster, right? The second is that just like a lot of countries around the, the, the world, they have become highly indebted in terms, in terms of the governments, 
they've actually loaded up on debt a lot. Uh, Poonam will tell you a little bit about what's happening in, uh, what is happening in India. Uh, but essentially, when you're loaded up with debt, then there are two things that actually, um, uh, uh, two things work against you. The first thing that works against you is to the extent that the government is borrowing in these domestic markets, the private sector cannot borrow, and as a result, private investment falls. The second thing that happens is that you always need some fiscal space to do the tough things in terms of structural reforms and so on, because they tend to be temporarily painful. And when you have very high levels of public debt, you don't have that room anymore, okay? So that's the second thing. Now, they're also facing a tough time outside the, their countries, and there are two two problems especially. The first problem, of course, is that they are growing in a world, or they're trying to grow in a world that has kind of turned against international trade, okay? So even though these countries actually have, uh, have benefited from international trade in the past, uh, if you look at uh, the, um, the number of trade restrictions, either explicit like export bans or import bans and so on, or implicit like huge subsidies to domestic enterprises and things like that, those things have gone up a lot. And this is especially the case for the large economies, right? Roughly speaking, the rich countries tend to give subsidies because they have the money and the poorer countries uh, tend to use things like export, export and import bans and things like that. Okay, so all of that is happening too. And then, then, of course, the last thing that's happening is that they are under a lot of pressure to do something about their energy consumption, okay? Uh, not just actually, uh, not just consume less energy, but consume cleaner energy, right? And so I'll tell you a little bit about, about, uh, about um, uh, three countries that actually um, were middle-income countries and have become high-income countries, right? So all three of these countries are now members of the OECD. And the, 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 these three countries are Korea, Poland, and Chile. The reason why we picked these countries is they're seen as successes. So Korea was a big success, probably the most successful development story ever, right? Um, um, and so Korea is probably the, the most successful story, at least in Asia, for sure. Uh, then the second one is Poland, which was actually, uh, which is considered a big success story since, uh, since 1990. And then the third one is Chile, which is the most successful Latin American country. And if you look at these countries and you say, what is it that they did? You start to then see why things are getting much tougher for middle income countries now. Right. So if you look, for example, at Korea, uh, you, you see what they did was the first thing that Korea did was ensured macro stability. Actually, all of them did rather well in terms of keeping inflation r r rates low, keeping fiscal deficits down and so on. The second thing that all of them did was they opened up their economies to foreign direct investment in one way or the other. Okay. The third thing that they did, all three of them, was they were incredibly good at they were incredibly good at educating their workforces. Okay, all three of them. Um, if you sort of look at their, uh, so if you look at their achievements, you actually find they did really well on trade. They did really well on education. They did really well on private investment. They did very well on macro stability. They tended all to do pretty badly on emissions on the energy consumption. So for example, even today, Korea is uh, still uh, uh, still a very, um, um, still, uses, uh, still uses a lot of coal, so does Poland. And Chile has always struggled to actually uh, get cleaner sources because it's not, it doesn't have oil and gas. It has other things, but it doesn't have, have oil and gas and it's far away and so, so to maintain competitiveness. But none of these countries are superstars when it comes to energy, okay? On enterprise, yes. On developing talent, yes, but not on energy. Okay, so those are the three parts of the report that we go through again and again. The first part looks at enterprise, the second part looks at people and, and uh, 
uh, how these countries have done in terms of developing talent. And then the third part is energy. So if you look, for example, at Korea, you actually find that what Korea did was, in terms of their enterprises, you have these sort of two clear stages, right? So the first stage is when what Korea's, all of Korea's policies were really geared to bringing in technologies from outside, right? And infusing them into the economy, right? So we call that stage in the report, we call that infusion. The second one was when you actually started to switch. As you got closer and closer to the technology frontier of the world and so on, they began to switch away from infusion and towards innovation in the sense of actually thing. Now, what the report also says is that these two stages are actually very, very different. They require many, many different things. I'm not going to get into all of them because I'm almost out of time, actually. But I know that I know that Ufuk Aishigit and Shomik Lal, who are actually the two, who are the two leaders of this report, they can actually tell you a lot more anything, right? Now, the other thing that happened, of course, I mean, here's Poland, right? And if you sort of look at Poland, it really catches up to the European average. So it's gone from about 20% of the EU average to around 50% rather quickly. And if you sort of see is that uh, part of what it did was Poland was absolutely stellar at improving its education system the secondary school system, and then the higher school. Uh, and what it did was it increased the output of universities and all so much that, in fact, a lot of Poles actually left for other parts of Europe, especially. But again, this is part of a successful strategy, not an unsuccessful strategy. Okay. In the case of Chile, as I said, is that they also did rather well. And uh, Chile did somewhat better on the energy transition, but not particularly well. Okay, So that's the thing that I do want you to take away, that these countries tended to be very, very, uh, really successful on a bunch of these things when it comes to enterprises, when it comes to talent, but not when it came to the consumption of, of, of uh, no, 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 not when it comes to the consumption of fossil fuels and so on. Okay, And I want you to just sort of keep that in mind. So basically what the report then does is it actually sort of takes a look now at how are these middle income countries doing? And I'll just show you a few charts from those, right? And there are these sort of three sets of facts I'll show you very, very quickly. The second part is the part that actually Ufuk will talk more about because he's been involved in actually, uh, uh, so he's been, uh, he's been involved in pushing the frontier of Schumpeterian creative destruction. That is Joseph Schumpeter, by the way. Uh, and then the third part is that we talk about what are the policies that these countries need to follow. And there's a very, uh, the, 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 there's actually, uh, there, uh, there, uh, there is a very influential paper by Bob Lucas called Making a Miracle. It's about, uh, uh, the, the, the story is about South Korea. And uh, basically what we talk about in part three is that, you know, for these countries to become high income economies over the next two decades, uh, so they would have to make miracles. Things are that tough for them. Okay? Things are going to be that tough for them and they're not going to get easier. Okay? So I'll just show you a few charts, some facts here. So, so the, the f first fact over here is that if you sort of look at countries that were um, that uh, uh, so how many countries actually sort of went above this threshold of, of 12,500 between 1990 and 2021? And essentially what you sort of see is there are uh, two or three sets of countries. The first set of countries, of course, is those in the European Union. The European Union may not be a great place for an advanced economy in terms of growth. It's a great place for a middle-income country. Okay, It actually helps to sort of uh, get these middle income countries to high levels of per capita income very, very quickly. Uh, the second group is actually very small states, like uh, especially the Caribbean states and so on. Uh, the third group is mostly the countries that have a lot of oil. So they have high per capita incomes. They don't always have the structures of high income economies. Uh, and then there are these few exceptions like Korea, right? Way up there. Okay. But the story is that, that if you look at the numbers of countries that didn't make it to, to these levels, they are much greater. These are countries that are still middle income countries today, about 100 of them. Okay. 
Okay. Now, if you look at uh, the, the, this and you say, okay, when do these countries, the, the, uh, the thing that we see is a stylized fact that basically sort of says, growth slows down quite sharply when these countries come to middle income. It's not always the same, but the median growth rate slowdown takes place at a per capita income that's less than a fifth of that of the United States, okay? So around around 20% of the US uh, thing, you start to sort of see the slowdown. Now, this slowdown is not the same for all countries. So countries that actually have greater economic freedom tend to have slowdowns that come much later. Okay, then those countries that actually have less economic freedom as measured by some measure that, 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 that you can take any measure, it doesn't matter. You actually see them, the, they tend to have these slowdowns much, much more quickly. But the main thing that you sort of see over here is that it's tough to institute these freedoms for whatever reason. And the other thing that you sort of see here is that growth does slow down. So that's the first stylized fact. The second stylized fact, of course, is that actually you find that countries that do grow through these things, they tend to have, they tend to change their structures a lot. So if you look at Korea, if you look at Poland, if you look at Chile, all these countries that actually go through all of these stages and get to high income, get close to the frontier, uh, they tend to sort of go from a strategy that is mostly investment based initially, then they switch from that to much more infusion of new technologies from abroad, however you do it. You can do it through patents, you can do it through FDI, you can do it through, uh, you, but, but they tend to be very open, right? And then the third one, of course, is that they make this other shift. They shift from infusion and investment, they also add innovation. And that involves a, a completely different type of openness. It actually demands much more economic freedom at home and so on. Okay, uh, so initially what you sort of see is that a large part of their growth, initial growth is actually because of investment, which means that the capital per worker goes up a lot. If you look to, to, towards the end, you, you actually see much of it is driven by greater productivity growth. These economies become much more efficient. That's the only way for them to grow once they get beyond a certain level of per capita income, around five, uh, 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 somewhere between uh, 10,000 and 12,000 or so, okay? And now the third thing that, that you see is that things are getting tougher for them, okay? Ah, so, you know, here's a chart that, 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 that actually shows how much progress these countries have made. And if you sort of look at this, you actually find the progress is not that much, right? So if you look at the purple line, those are middle income countries excluding China. So the median middle income country has basically stagnated at around, uh, you know, between 15 and 20 percent of U.S. per capita income. Okay, and if you look at, uh, you know, once you include China, of course, that shifts. But it's a large part of it is a China story and perhaps one or two other countries. But in general, the past for these countries, it's been tough. To, uh, it, 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 so it has been tough for these countries to infuse new ideas into their economies. And this is going to get tougher, okay? And it's going to get tougher for these reasons. One of these reasons, of course, is that if you look at uh, harmful trade policies now outnumber those that are beneficial. Um, and the second part is, uh, this by the way is especially true after 2018 or so, but it's basically the uh, G20 countries that are mostly to blame for this, okay? So you hear these G20 countries, they actually get together and they talk a really good game about, about, about uh, uh, you, you know, world prosperity and stuff like that. But then they go back home and they take actions that are actually exactly contrary to that. Okay? Uh, and then the other thing, of course, is that because of good reasons, uh, that there is a lot of concern about climate. And then the question then is, you start to sort of see policies like uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism of the European Union. And what that chart shows is what that does to middle income countries. And if you see over there, uh, of course, it really hurts Africa. Uh, th there are uh, 
uh, cl close to 20 middle income countries in Africa too, by the way. Uh, but then you sort of see uh, that, uh, that that China d d d does really poorly, so does India and so on under the carbon border adjustment mechanism. These all, what, what all this means is, I mean, it's that third stylized fact and so on that is going to get harder and harder for these countries that depend a lot on infusing their economies with new technologies and so on. Trade, trade is getting harder and there are all of these barriers to trade like the CBAM and so on. Again, very well intentioned, but at the end, they make things harder for the middle income economies. I'm, I'm way over time, so I'm going to, I'm going to um, um, just whiz through these slides. And these slides, basically, I'll just sort of talk about one slide, which uh, uh, um, uh, so, so I'm going to skip this and I'm going to let Ufuk and others actually go through these slides. But the slide that I wanted to sort of show to you is this one, which is that when we apply these new ideas, the ideas that people like Champeter, then Philippe Aguillon, and Howitt, and then their students like, uh, like Ufuk, uh, they've developed these theories to a point that we think that, that, that uh, uh, we actually think that their ideas are, are, are key to trying to sort of help middle income countries get to high income, uh, especially, uh, especially as things are getting harder and harder for them, right? But it requires certain sh uh, shifts in thinking, right? And we try to sort of summarize all of this stuff. Ufuk may not agree with all of them, by the way, because he's an academic and he likes to sort of be precise about things. Uh, we at the World Bank, we like uh, to not be precise about things. Uh, but, uh, but essentially, at the end, it has to be a really simple message, right? And the simple message here is that, uh, that you see that these countries that policymakers tend to be fixated on things like firm size distributions. Small firms are good, large firms are bad, okay? And one of the things that comes from the work that Ufuk and others have done is that is actually not just, uh, that's not just an incorrect generalization, it's a very harmful generalization because you need both large firms and small firms, some more than others, depending on the stage thing. So what we actually find is that rather than focus on things like firm size and firm age and so on, you really need to sort of focus much more on value added. So you don't want to look at firms independently of the value chains in which they belong, okay? And once you do that, you actually find that you have to sort of get away from this fixation that big firms are bad and small firms are good. The second thing that we find is that, the, uh, that generally speaking, middle income countries have a lot less talent than high income economies. Middle income countries also tend to allocate this talent far more inefficiently than do high income economies. Okay? And part of the reason, again, there is that they fixate on income distributions and things like this. I'm almost done. Um, and w w w what we say is that you need to sort of change the thinking to social mobility. The third thing is that we find that the way that, the way that things are being discussed in terms of the energy transition and so on, there is a lot of fixation on the sources of energy. Is it gas? Is it is it oil? Is it coal? Is it renewables? Is it solar, etc.? Okay, and what we find is that actually a, 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 a far more productive way to sort of think about this is to look at GHG emissions. Okay, because emissions are the reason why we have this problem. It's not because uh, so uh, the. the uh, way to think about this is to switch from looking at the distribution of energy sources to looking at GHG emissions. Now, all of this stuff is easier said than done because all of these things are much more data intensive. You need to sort of have much better data. And so all of these theories, uh, they tend to actually give you a far, gr uh, uh, a far better diagnosis of what is ailing the economy 
or what is going well in the economy or not. They are actually much better than their earlier techniques. The way that uh, we characterize these techniques is like they are like MRI. Uh, th 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 they are like MRI machines, right? They can actually give a dynamic view of the things. They're not like X-rays. That's what we've been using so far. But in order for us to be able to use these things, we need to have much better data. Okay, and we don't. And generally speaking, what we are finding is that these middle-income countries are scoring many own goals in the sense that what they're doing is that they're making their data less reliable rather than more reliable okay but i'm going to stop over here and bring the panel because i've gone on too long um so i should i'm told that i have to just introduce the introduce the panelists and ask them to come uh to the chairs the first one is ufuk um who is the arnold c harbour uh, the arnold c harbour professor <laughs> of economics come on uh, uh at Chicago, and he's a, a lead academic for the World Development Report. The second is Poonam Gupta. She's, she is the Director General of India's National Council of, of Applied Economic Research. Uh, oh, uh, welcome, Poonam. Thank you for coming. And then the third is uh, Shomik Lal, who's the Staff Director of the World Bank's 2024 World Development Report. He and Ufuk have been joined at the hip. Okay. Uh, All right. Okay. And uh, the session is going to be moderated by Shomik, right? Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't get through all of the slides. Yep. Let's start with a big round of applause for Indomir. That was a great conversation starter. And, and I think it's very rare that someone from the World Bank will tell you something that's less than rosy. And, and you kind of raised a lot of the issues in the mid about the challenges. So what we will do in the next hour is have a conversation with the panelists, but then turn it out to you for the questions you have of them. I'm not sure if there are folks who are taking your questions, but I would encourage them to kind of see who wants to come in. And so why don't we start with a couple of rounds of questions to the panelists and then have the audience participate, right? So, so in the mid, let me kind of start just kind of as a continuation of the issues you raised. You were the one who came up with the term, the middle income trap in 2006. And that gained a lot of traction with policymakers around the world. And it drew a lot of debate among academics. And now the World Development Report of 2024 provides a different view and a new view of looking at middle-income transitions and creative destruction. I just want you to kind of explain what, so what's new in this approach. So back when we, uh, uh, when we actually started using that term, right? So we were doing this report on East Asia and especially the rise of China and so on. And the reason why we were doing that report, Shomik, was because the East Asians were very concerned that their future would not look like Korea and Taiwan and Japan and others, that their future was looking more and more like uh, Brazil and Argentina and Colombia and these countries that had actually gone very quickly to, to middle income levels and then just stayed there, okay? Uh, and it seemed like they got trapped, okay? And so what we ended up doing was we ended up using this term. I have to admit that we actually came up with the term at the end of writing that report. So we actually used that term almost in a throwaway sense because there was a lot of other really good stuff in that report. Nobody remembers that. This term caught on. <laughs> it caught on because I think that Chinese, uh, especially the Chinese, they were very concerned about mm -hmm. this because they felt like their trajectories were looking a lot more like the Latin American countries. For example, one of them was that um, that uh, they tended to have f really fast growing inequality, right? income inequality. So as a result, that's part of the reason why they ended up fixating a lot on income inequality, right? The other thing that we thought was that these countries needed to make one transition. And the main thing that comes out in the work that you and Ufuk have been doing is that actually it's not one transition, it's two. The problem is harder 
than we thought it was, right? Uh, but I think mainly uh, what are the two big value added of this uh, uh, thing? One is that you actually uh, you actually present the facts about this rather than just some hand waving thing that we did back then. And then the other thing is you apply uh, these ideas that have been developed since that time, since 2000, or since actually, since the early 90s, right? right? And I think that these are the ideas that will actually help these countries understand. Now, it's also much more demanding in the sense to actually apply these ideas in these countries. You need, you need to understand these techniques a lot more. You need to go beyond even the second moments of these distributions and so on and start to look at the, the, and start to look at the dynamics. But without this, uh, even if the world was not turning against these countries, even if the global economy was not turning against these countries, they would not succeed. Thank you, Indamit. Uh, Ufuk, let me turn to you. So when countries like in Latin America slowed down, people said, it's the incumbents. The people who are forming cartels, they have a lot of market power, they're blocking others from coming. So. But when you look at Korea, the large firms, the incumbents, actually led progress. And you are the one, I think, who have been instrumental in changing the view of analytic thinking on this, that it's not only the newcomers who are driving change, but the incumbents can drive change. But as Indemit mentioned, now it's not easy to hand wave and saying big firms are bad. We need much more refined techniques. And in fact, Ufuk is the person who has been leading this new thinking and creative destruction through his papers. So, Ufuk, how can we take the insights from this update of the way you brought it and apply it to a middle income country such as yours, like Turkey? And how would you go about figuring out the problem differently? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a very important question and probably a little bit of a historical journey would be helpful to, to understand uh, uh, how we came to this point also in the literature and also in terms of the, the, the report. Of course, there have been many, many extremely important uh, uh, economic growth theories. For instance, the most famous ones are obviously the solo uh, uh, growth model, which taught us that capital accumulation is very important, especially for very poor countries. But the theory was, uh, Bob Solo was also telling us that capital accumulation will bring countries up to a certain point. Beyond that, you need to start using your resources more effectively. And how should we use them more effectively? He was silent about that. Then Paul Romer, another former Chicago student who won the Nobel Prize, Bob Sala also won the Nobel Prize, obviously, uh, came along and said, uh, this efficiency is uh, going to happen through new technologies and through profit-driven uh, uh, entrepreneurs who are going to introduce new technologies. But in the Romer model, the way things work in Romer, Romer's world is think about like a dining table, a long dining table, and every time there's a new entrepreneur coming, we are adding a new chair to the table. And then the, the table was growing and growing and growing. So that was the way Paul was thinking about it. I see both the, the solo model and the, the, the Romer model as uh, naive models of, of thinking about economic growth because every action in their model, in their world, is something useful for the society. But then when I, I'm teaching economic growth, indeed I was in class yesterday, and, and uh, so I'm trying to give some examples. And one example I gave was, uh, I want to talk about cell phones, and I, I thought about my cell phone that I used at, in my college, which was Ericsson. And I, I talked about the Ericsson cell phone, and you know my students were looking blank at me. And then I want to talk about Blackberry, but again, it didn't resonate. <laughs> so uh, clearly I was failing because technologies were are becoming old very fast. We are living in a world where things are, you know, uh, changing extremely rapidly. There is turn turnover in the market, in technologies. I, again, I, we had a guest last week uh, from Europe. I want to reserve a restaurant. I called my favorite restaurant. It turned out that it closed. Uh, so we couldn't go there because there's this churn. Why? Because the dining table isn't getting longer and longer and longer. The number of seats is fixed. The entrepreneurs sitting in those tables, in those seats, are changing. 
But once you start reasoning through that logic, suddenly you realize, well, Shomik, if you're sitting in that seat and I'm willing to take that seat from you, you're not going to give it away to, to me so easily. You will start fighting back. Maybe by doing something more productive, but maybe by trying to block me. So that's exactly how we start uh, thinking. And once you start thinking through this reasoning of creative destruction, suddenly new possibilities open up. And the way we try to do things is that first we start, as also uh, Indermit mentioned, we try to do an MRI basically, look at the data, try to first understand what's happening, then go back to the theory and use the theory to read the data. Then suddenly, once you start reading the, the data through the lens of creative destruction, you suddenly start realizing that, well, in Italy, as firms are becoming the dominant market leader, as they are growing and starting to dominate the market, they are innovating less. What do they do in return? They start hiring more politicians into their companies. Why are they doing it? Creative destruction is telling you they are not going to give their seats so easily, obviously. Or when you look at the, for instance, Turkish manufacturing sector, the entrants are less productive than exiters. Whereas the theory should tell you the opposite. So suddenly once you start reasoning uh, the, the, the data through the lens of a theory, things start to emerge and now as you mentioned, you know, countries are slowing down and we are trying to find a reason why they are slowing down. But this is just like going to the doctor and saying, hey, I have a headache. And then you cannot just give them an off the shelf medication. And uh, we know that that doesn't work. And, and for countries slowing down, there are many, many different reasons, obviously, right? And uh, for instance, when we look at the Indian firms, in India, firm size correlates very strongly with family size. The owner of the family size is correlates very strongly with firm size, but less so in those regions where the institutional quality is higher, for instance. So clearly there's something richer in the data that's taking place. And that's why it's a dialogue. So that's why in terms of our research uh, contribution, this tight dialogue between data and theory has been key. And the second uh, 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 part to, 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 to your point is that there's no one size fits all uh, uh, solution to these problems. And you can't just look at the large firms or small firms and say, hey, it should be this way or that way. Because we see, uh, when we look around the world, we see many different instances. Yes, US economy has benefited from successful startups. But when you look at the German economy, another super successful uh, country, the entry rate the new establishment creation rate has been less than 50% of the US. It's not a startup nation, it's an incumbent nation. Mercedes, BMW, Audi has been competing for so many years. Merck and, uh, uh, you know, uh, so Puma, Adidas, right? Uh, you see uh, Bosch competing against Siemens. So for many, many years, they have been competing with each other. And all these companies were formed before 1950. How did they manage it? If the size of the pie is fixed, then, of course, as I'm expanding it to shrinking spaces, now I will start thinking strategically, how can I deter new entry? But if we can make this pie bigger and bigger, then I will not get into strategic actions anymore. And that's exactly what we observe in the German economy. They are not competing locally. They are competing globally. And they are also sharing a lot of information. So these are different growth models. US model in early 90s and 80s through startups have been very successful, obviously. But the German model has also been successful through incumbents. So that's why it's not about the firm size. It's about who is bringing the new ideas to the table. It's about identifying the good players in the economy and supporting them rather than just looking sheer at the out, uh, you know, the, the way uh, they look from outside and, and then, you know, announcing them as winners and losers, basically. Uh, so, Ufuk, you raised two very important points. One is that it's very difficult just looking at firms, large or small, to say who's going to do well, who's going to obstruct progress. The second, you made this very interesting insight on India on the links between family-owned firms and form, firms being small. And let me use that as a segue to go to Poonam. And, and friends, uh, Poonam uh, is uh, an economic, part of the Economic Advisory Council to the Indian Prime Minister. And as part of the role, she's, she's kind of very involved in India's policy making. And, and just for audience context, uh, India is a low middle income country with about a per capita income of 2,500. So it's not very close to the thresholds in the mid that you described about 
what Chile and, and Poland were going through. But Poonam, here, what the question is that Ufuk mentioned, listen, we have growth that happens when firms that are doing well, they sort of expand their market share and resources are better utilized. But this takes a lot of thinking about competition and about contraction and getting rid of outdated arrangements. So how are you thinking Indian policymaking and researchers examining these issues? Thank you uh, for having me here. It's a brilliant WDR that we hope to implement in India as well. So as many of you may know, India is the flavor of the decade, if not the next quarter century. It's currently the fastest growing um, major economy around the world. It's still a low middle income country, which means it has a lot of untapped potential to continue to grow. And the ambition of uh, India's leadership is that it will become actually a high middle, high income country in the next 25 years when India completes 100 years of its independence. Now, is India going to defy the middle income trap? Uh, the hope is certainly that it will. Using the framework that uh, in the myth presented, there are a lot of things that are going well for India, which will help it defy uh, the middle income trap. Macroeconomic stability is something that the policymakers are very serious about. And they manage the economy in such a way that you do not see any obvious sense or signs of macroeconomic instability. Infrastructure building is happening at a very, very rapid pace. Human capital formation is happening as well. And productivity growth, uh, you know, we are talking about firm size and churning. But basically, the way productivity growth is being envisaged is through the use of digital technology. You know, using the WDR framework of invest, imitate, and innovate, I would say India has not really done very well on the imitation part, and partly because it has not been very open to FDI. And it may seem a little bit of an ambitious task to go directly from invest to innovation, but that's really the mindset is currently. And in terms of investment as well, India has been highly productive in getting the most out of its investment. And the number of reasons for that, one of, the, one of which is that it caters to a larger extent to the domestic market rather than to the global market, which means the pressures to become globally competitive are rather weaker. So the, the framework that we are talking about, firm size, productivity, churning, is not really the framework that policymakers currently are thinking about. But this is the direction in which we need to go if we actually want to defy the middle income trap. And this is exactly how the WDR would be useful. Just a couple of more sentences on how this framework, um, policymakers are agnostic about the framework. Destruction is a bad word, mm. right? Why destruct something that exists? Mm -hmm. Productivity is something that at least the policymakers, who are mostly politicians, do not relate to as much as to employment. So whatever generates employment is good, productivity for another day. So what happens in the process is that while entry has been liberalized across sectors, FDI is not encouraged as much as it was in East Asia, as in the myth mentioned. But exit is, is not a comfortable word. Exit is very, very hard. So there is a coexistence of small and large, more small than than large. There is a coexistence of low productivity firms with large productivity firms. There is coexistence of lagging regions with leading regions. So it's it's like a large joint family syndrome that we are in currently. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks so much, Poonam. That was very insightful. I've been told that we are uh, turning to questions and answers from the audience. So Folks, if you have questions, please come to the mic, introduce yourself. We'll take about three questions at a go. Good evening. Uh, my name is Hadi Bhatt. Um, thank you very much for a great discussion. 
Uh, my, I'm a CEO of a technology firm, so my question is related to technology, the rise of AI, the rise of JAI, seems to, economists will really say there's going to be a real impact on the service industry jobs. So as you think about India, as you think about other countries, how does it help or hinder the growth of these countries from where they are to higher income? And is that factored into your policy and planning? Great. Uh, let's take two more and then we'll turn to the panelists. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Jose Villalobos. I'm an MBA student at Chicago Booth. Um, uh, it seems like a lot of these policy choices that are clear and, and just the correct thing to do from an economic perspective are often very politically costly. And that ends up dissuading a lot of people politicians from from actually enacting them. So what kind of conversations are being had with policymakers or, or how do you build the right incentives and the right communication so that a lot of this is adopted more often? Great. Let's take one more for this round. Good evening. I'm Animesh Ghoshal from DePaul University just down the road. Um, Professor Gill, you talked about or Dr. Gill, rather, uh, you talked about three countries uh, which you consider successes in terms of breaking out of the middle income trap. Could you say something about countries that have failed to do this and what can we learn from those? Because I think we can learn a lot from failures too, not just successes. Thank you. Great, thank you. Should we do the following? In the mid, then Poonam, and then Ufuk. Yeah, on the new technologies point, you know, we were just talking with people who were looking at exactly that question in India, right? And I think that the example that they gave, I'm trying to recreate that example, Shomik. The, uh, 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 the example was that of companies like Zomato, which is like the Uber Eats of, uh, of the US. Um, you know, that, that um, the, I guess the aim is to uh, try to to try to resolve all of the transactions without human interference, right? Or human intervention needed, right? Because anytime human intervention is needed, it's costly. Um, so uh, they end up doing quite well on that one. But then uh, basically what they found now is that you can actually resolve a large part of what was actually uh, that, that required human intervention that can now be done by AI okay so which means that which means that rather than uh, that part of the value added of that firm is not being captured anymore by the employee but is being captured by the supplier of the AI so they actually have to transfer that money to open AI because they're using that so what their point is that you have to start to invest not in technology services or you have to invest in the technology itself, okay? Um, because otherwise you start to sort of lose, you start to lose more and more of your value added to some firm that that is not an Indian firm anymore and is not an Indian worker either. So. The point that you mentioned is a very real one. You're absolutely right about that. Basically, it means that you have to you have to have you have to have a certain amount of sophisticated manufacturing punam, because if you don't have that, uh, you're not going to be able to actually address this problem. So even if you only cared about employment, you would have to start to care about imitation or. Uh, uh, start to use uh, or start to build on the technologies that you bring from outside, right? Um, the point on the put uh, that you're absolutely right about the point that you have to sort of look at the political aspects of these things. So I didn't get to all of the slides there, but you actually sort of see the experience of these successful economies. You actually find that they do actually have to sort of deal with these problems about the politics of things. And in general, all three of the economies that, that, that I mentioned, Poland, Korea, as well as Chile, ended up using crises as times in which you actually ended up making politically tough decisions, right? So, for example, in the case of Korea, what happened was that, that you, had, uh, you, had, you had a powerful group of incumbents 
large firms like Sang uh, Yong and Daewoo and so on. And basically, uh, they had uh, they had essentially captured a large part of the politics, because what they had done was that uh, uh, that uh, uh, they ended up essentially borrowing abroad in dollars and lending at home in won, but mainly to their own companies and so on. And when the Asian financial crisis came, it, that was used by that was used. Uh, by the Korean politicians to actually make changes in this, right? To actually open up those things. The same thing is true in Chile. You've had several crises and so on. I think I think one of the ways that Schumpeterian uh, theory actually differs from the way that we've been looking at this, in general, you found that the whole idea, the whole sort of, the whole emphasis of policy making of of uh, the institutions in Washington and so on is avoid crises, avoid crises, keep the crises as small as, as short as possible, as shallow as possible and so on. And one of the things about Champeter and creative destruction is that yes, you don't want a very long crisis because crises tend to destroy things a lot, but you do want to make sure that at least for middle income countries that actually have to change their structures if you want to change your structures over decades rather than centuries, you're going to have to sort of you have you have to have an additional uh, you have to have an additional imperative for these governments. They have to come out of these crises with very different structures than they went into them. Okay, and you have to be absolutely deliberate about it, right? Uh, so I think that these are the sort of things that the Chinese are thinking about too, and these are the things that sooner or later India. Any successful middle-income country that is growing fast will have a crisis, and the question is, how do you sort of uh, think? Now, if if you had to sort of say, uh, uh, what are the lessons that we've learned from the from the countries that haven't succeeded? I'm just thinking about the countries, the the, uh, uh, the uh, world champions of middle income are <laughs> are Russia and Argentina and uh, I guess Venezuela, uh, which actually went backwards, so did Argentina. Um, and I could, uh, so I could count these examples for you and I think that you'll sort of uh, see that they probably don't need too much explanation, right? In any case, I should hand it back to you. Puna. So, um let me combine these questions in a slightly broader framework, assuming that there is some interest to, to, to know a little bit about the Indian economy. So technology is actually helping India leapfrog in a number of areas. Um, that includes banking, retail that Indamit mentioned, payment systems, logistics, credit availability, governance. Um, integrating the economy and helping the economy become formal and increasing tax revenues. So, in fact, um, that's India's biggest ticket to prosperity currently. You know, there was a time, some of us who have been working on India for decades, so about 20 years ago, we used to hear about you have to open up your retail sector for it to become efficient and you need reforms in the sector. Now, retail sector was never reformed. What changed was digital. And the sector has become as efficient as anywhere else. Similarly, governing a very large country, a very diverse country uh, efficiently is happening because of digital. So the question really is, um, you know, will digital also help make India's manufacturing sector more competitive when it's still a protected sector, unlike the East Asian countries and perhaps like some of the East Asian countries. And I agree with Indamit that unless India uh, continues to do well and even better in manufacturing as well as services, um, the the journey to prosperity would be would be harder. Um, just just one point on on economic macroeconomic crisis, an area in which I have been working on. That's where my research has mostly been focused. My own analysis shows, uh, along with my colleagues at uh, the think tank which I currently head in India, uh, at least during the next decade, 
and if things continue the way they are much longer, India is unlikely to have a macroeconomic crisis, which means that uh, the this march towards efficiency and productivity and churning will have to happen without a crisis, will have to happen within an electoral democracy. So, which means that, you know, the, the importance of research and data and um, Convincing the policymakers to use the right framework becomes that much more important. Um, and just, just very, very, very quickly, you know, India being a diverse country with 28 states, some of our recent work shows diversity across states. So when we are asking about are there countries or are there economists which have not been able to um, to get out of the trap and what are the reasons? In fact, within India, we are seeing regions which are actually are trapped not in a low middle income uh, threshold, but they are actually low income economies. How do they come out of those? So again, working on a large economy, thinking about a large economy, lessons from around the world become very important, uh, including on how do you make sure that these smaller, uh, not necessarily smaller economies, but economies which are held back, even below the low middle income levels, how do you bring them up? Thank you. So, uh, I would like to just uh, mention that, uh, so the, the, the main fundamental argument behind all these things is to create merit-based societies. And somehow the question is, how can we build a system uh, where really the productive ones can expand, the smart ones can rise up in the society and take the important positions and, and lead the societies. I think that's really the underlying uh, mechanism here. And when we look at, you know, fail failed uh, scenarios, there are many, many examples, many, many examples, both from the rich world and also from the uh, from the poorer side. Uh, Indermit gave uh, fantastic examples, but let me mention another one. Um, for instance, you know, when you when you look at East Germany, it's been more than 30 years since reunification and still the productivity gap between East and West Germany is more than 20 percent, despite the fact that West Germany has spent so much money. But what happened at the time, obviously, you know, uh, and this also relates to Punam's point, after the wall came down, of course, it was a hard time and unemployment uh, started to go up and this created a panic among policymakers. And as you said, it's really hard to see, to let companies go. It's always hard to say goodbye, right? As they say at the airport. But if you don't do it in the short run, you're paying the price in the long run. And at the time, uh, I don't know how much uh, uh, of how many of you know uh, uh, about the German history, but at the time when the privatization was taking place, the head of the privatization agency got assassinated and, and he, he passed away. And immediately with that panic, immediately the firms got privatized, but instead of asking a price to sell the companies, they asked for labor commitments. They said, keep 10,000 workers in three years and this company is yours. But this means that you're not letting unproductive firms to go away and to disappear and, and get them replaced by more productive ones. You're just delaying the problem. And when you delay the problem after 30 years, you still see this massive productivity gap. Do we see success stories that's comparable to East Germany? Yes. Look at Poland, for instance. You know, after so many years now, uh, Poland, the Polish economy is predicted to surpass the UK economy by 2030. And that's partly thanks to the hard budget constraint that were imposed on state-owned enterprises. And whenever they were in trouble, they, they were not saved at the time. And that's why I think when we are thinking about industrial policy, we have to be really careful about, you know, are we really allowing for productive firms to, to rise up? Because uh, alternatively, if we are too obsessed about firm size and employment, then that's exactly what leads uh, also policymakers to keep state-owned enterprises alive. And when we look at the report, for instance, in those industries where state-owned enterprises are dominating the industry, they are crowding out private enterprises. The private industries, private firms, R&D investment is going down. Yes, in the short run, everything looks great, but we need technology, we need R&D, we need change to grow in the future, to have more jobs, high quality jobs, high paying jobs for the future. And that's why there's this trade-off between short run and long run. And that's not very well appreciated by policymakers because their horizon is short. They need to fix the economy ASAP, but what's good for the society is 
the, those structural reforms that will pay off in five years and 10 years. And that's exactly where the tension emerges. And that, that was an excellent question also by Great. Chicago MBA student. <laughs> Great. Uh, I'm going to turn to the next round of questions. But before that, there's a placeholder for you for the next round. So I think what you mentioned, hey, listen, we need to change the way we do assessments. Let's not look at firm size. Let's not look at income distribution. Let's look at merit. Most of your fellow economists are still looking at firm sizes and income distributions and making careers out of that. And, and then the thing about policy making, exit is good. Again, it's harder, easier said than done, right? So, so what I want you to think as the other questions come in is, what can we do, and for all of us, what's the way to change the intellectual thinking and the policy thinking around it? Okay, let's have a, some more questions and then we'll have the last round of responses from our panelists. My question, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, is concerning SOEs, state-owned enterprises. You mentioned China. I believe the state-owned enterprises run to about 70% of the country. Russia also is around 70 to 80%. Okay. Can you uh, discuss the interrelationship between SOEs and the rate of productivity in particular countries? Thank you. Thank you. Excellent question. Excellent question. Um, I'm an economic student at the University of Chicago, and my question is surprisingly related. So I believe that it is uncontroversial to say that authoritarianism authoritarianism is on the rise worldwide. Milton Friedman in his work with Pinochet intended for the free market to create an ultimately free country. Do you believe that a democratic system is necessary to achieve a high income economy or is the political system rather independent from the economic system? Great question. Thank Thanks, you. Sir. Hi, I'm Vedant. I'm a student at the Harris School at U Chicago. My question actually sort of connects the two diverse strands of thoughts that both Professor and Dr. Indramit Gill referred to. And the idea that firms need to exit and we, we need to have greater economic freedom intersect very nicely at rules and legal principles and the legal institutions which actually enforce these. So could you address uh, this issue and with respect to India, uh, could you give us an assessment of what India needs to do more in this area, given that the changes in rule of law have been very inframarginal? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks for the wonderful session. Uh, my name is Madhukar. I'm a second year policy student at the University of Chicago High School. Uh, my question is, given the global nature of climate change, how can middle-income uh, countries collaborate internationally to reduce the carbon emissions while ensuring continued economic growth? Uh, and i rather say, what will be your message to the developed economies to help the other economies to make a more uh, collaborative ecosystem rather than a competitive one? Thank you. Thank you. Last question. Uh, Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Matt Coolis. I am a uh, student at DePaul University. Um, a few things were mentioned today that, you know, kind of sparked a little bit of thought and interest in there. So, and one of those things was uh, capital investment in new technologies. And one of those things that I was trying to think about and, you know, kind of wrap into something that's you know, rapidly approaching would be the uh, Bitcoin halving. And so I'm wondering, as a country that does not have the privilege that the United States does of having the world reserve currency and, you know, being impacted by increases in M2. And, you know, it's something where it's, it's I'm wondering, you know, in, in order to make that capital investment, you have to have that economic utility or, you know, that future value, that ability to store value. And I'm wondering if you're unable to store that value and you see your purchasing power rapidly or decrease in whatever fiat currency you're measuring, what steps or actions do you plan to take uh, in order to secure that purchasing power, you know, in order to make that, you know, capital investment into future technologies that will propel us into, you know, the next stages of humanity. Right. Thank so. you very much. Okay. Let's do the following. We have a few minutes left. I'm going to start with Poonam, Ufuk, and then Indamit has the last word, right? 
Uh, can we say two minutes each? Because there are lots of questions. Mm -hmm. And then you can have a conversation with the panelists before they leave. So, so I'll, I'll take, take actually two. One is on the SOEs and how is India thinking about it. There is ideological commitment to letting things go to more productive hands and private sector. But it has been very, very difficult to do so for two reasons. One is, of course, the political one. The other is just the administrative capacity to do it right. So, for example, in the budget of the national government every year, there is a commitment to privatize two banks. And that commitment has been there for nearly 10 years. Which two banks, we don't know, and the banks have not been privatized. But every year, and my understanding is it, they, the ministry, concerned ministry, has not been able to first have the political courage. The courage is only, so commitment is announced every year that we are committed to the goal, but it has not happened. Uh, Arvind Panagaria, professor at the University of Columbia, uh, and I wrote a paper a year ago on bank privatization, where we boldly recommended that all banks should be privatized except for the largest one. And the kind of hate mail we got was very interesting. Um, so that's on privatization, ideological commitment, but has not resulted in action. That's only at the part of the national government. The re provincial governments do not yet understand the value of that. So it's not being discussed there. And this is exactly where research can be useful. On um, uh, political systems and uh, the progress on economics. So at least in India, we have seen that good economics has resulted in good political outcomes. The challenge is managing the short run pain, which is very, very hard in a democracy. Um, and I'll just stop there. Thank you, Puna. Um, so, Shomik, let me start quickly uh, from uh, your earlier question. Uh, firm size is, uh, especially large firms, uh, is obviously a result of successful investment sometimes, but it's not a cause of success, right? So that's why I think policymakers sometimes uh, uh, get confused about that. And, and that's why uh, I see a lot of large firm obsessions. Sometimes I see a lot of small firm obsessions too. And uh, that's why just to uh, make firms larger, uh, sometimes governments try to pick winners, for instance. And by hand, they try to grow those firms. But we need to, we need to understand the following. Normally, these economies will go forward if there's a merit-based selection mechanism. And this is also true for firms. Entrepreneurs will start. The ones that have successful ideas will grow, start uh, uh, absorbing the resources economy, and then they will start growing. In an economy like this, firm size will be a reflection of success. And we shouldn't be against a, a successfully expanding firm because they are just uh, uh, delivering uh, on, 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 on their promise, basically. So that's why in an economy where productivity and firm size go hand in hand, uh, there's nothing wrong with having large firms. Indeed, that, that might be even desirable. But if firms are, firms are growing, we should not be just focusing on their size. We should also be looking at their investment. If they start getting involved into some strategic investment, uh, strategic behavior or misbehavior to slow down competition, and we see a lot of that evidence, and I just gave you an example of the Italian economy, there we should be against large firms' activities, of course. So that's why, uh, first, when we are looking at the firm size distribution, this is just part of the equation. This is just the beginning of the conversation. The second thing that we should immediately look at is the productivity of these firms, and then also look at their investment or strategic investment uh, in that regard. And in some countries, there is also the following confusion. I would like to touch upon this issue very quickly too. There is small firm uh, uh, obsession, and, and sometimes uh, people are getting very excited for the fact that there are a lot of small firms. It means there's a lot of dynamism. There is uh, a lot of energy. Not necessarily. Having a lot of small firms could also mean that there is a lot of desperation in the economy. For instance, when we look at the small business registry numbers, they went to record high levels in the US right after COVID, way above before. So massive number of small firms in the US. But when we look at the employment share of small firms, it's been declining. 
So we have more small firms on paper, more uh, small businesses on paper, but without employment. So clearly, this is not out of success. This is not because uh, individuals became suddenly more productive overnight after COVID. If anything, people got more depressed after COVID, uh, if anything, because people were desperate. They lost their jobs and they started to, uh, they start their own business. And many of the developing countries or poor, poor economies have a lot of small firms because large firms are not able to grow and offer high paying jobs. As a result, people are not going to go home hungry. They start their own business, becoming street vendors, bike repair shops, etc. As a result, you know, uh, uh, if you look at that economy, then you might say, hey, there's a lot of energy here. Let's pour more uh, small, small business or uh, micro credit programs in these in these countries. This is exactly the opposite of what we should be doing, right? We shouldn't be offering more small business subsidies in an economy where there are a lot of small businesses out of necessity. This requires, again, I think uh, Indermit put it extremely uh, uh, nicely and correctly. This is almost like an MRI. You know, just looking at the uh, heart rate is not sufficient. Just looking at the firm size distribution is not sufficient. We need to look at all other vital signs. We need to look at all other parts of the statistics in the economy to understand where the problems are so that we can come up with the right diagnosis and with right medication. Indeed, not every industrial policy is uh, beneficial. If it's done uh, wrongly, it can even make things worse. It's just like giving the wrong medication to a patient. In that case, you can just make things uh, much worse than without any treatment, basically. Thank you, Fook. I think this is a very sobering point, right? Often we get into this illusion that seeing a lot of small firms means there's great entrepreneurship. But what happens is actually they are entrepreneurs because of necessity and they don't have safety nets to fall back on. And rather the challenge is there's not enough business dynamism. And in fact, some of these ideas that Ufuk has developed have really framed how we work and think in, put the thinking in the WDR. So, uh, so that will be very, uh, I think this is really, really sobering, but very important insight. In the middle, you have the last word. So lots of very, very good questions. And I was trying to sort of think how to answer them. Um, so the first one is, you know, on this, I guess on the small size versus large firms and so on, I thought that the example that Mario Marcel gave us for Chile was a very good one where he said that what they were trying to do was they were trying to sort of see why is it that small Chilean firms don't export, right? And so they tried to sort of create schemes and so on to actually encourage small firms to export. And they found that they failed, okay? Uh, but then when he moved to the central bank, they actually had, the, they had much better data and they started to sort of look at it. And they found what that scheme actually did was it actually encouraged the smaller firms to, to act, form links with the large firms who were the final exporters. So in terms of value added, small firms were actually exporting. It was just seen much more as the export of large firms. And so his point was that you need to sort of see these entire value change rather than look at small firm, large firms. That's why that whole point that we were talking about, value added, value added, value added. Okay, that, 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 that was one thing. The second thing was, I guess, in terms of the pace of change that people talked about. In, um, so, uh, so all the things that are going against, against, against the middle income countries and so on, there's one thing that could go for them, right? And that could be these new digital technologies, Poonam, right? Now, if you look at these technologies, these are called general purpose technologies, right? So you have sort of, you know, four general purpose technologies over the ages. And if you, uh, the, the, the first one was steam, the second one was electricity, the third one was information technology, and now you have machine learning. And what you sort of see is that the pace at which these technologies get diffused into production, into consumption, into how households and firms and others interact, has actually, uh, that, is, that has been the big change in the sense that the first technologies, the steam engine, uh, uh, you, you know, to, 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 to took about 80 years to actually diffuse in the thing. The second one, which was electricity, took about 40. And then if you look at, the, the, then if you look at information technology, it's more like two decades, right? 20. And the problem now is that, you know, if that's the rule, then the next technology is gonna happen <laughs> over the next decade. Mm -hmm. So all of this stuff is gonna come much, much more quickly. 
so so as i was thinking about this i was thinking about what punam said she said well you know the next decade for india is going to be development without a crisis i'm not so sure okay <laughs> because we also talk about we also talk about things like employment right i know for example in china that's becoming a crisis in india we don't know whether it's a crisis or not because we don't have the data but if we did have the data we might be able to think now that's the other thing that you you know as these economies become more and more complex the one thing that the one thing that governments can provide everybody are reliable data so that you get everybody to actually try to sort of see what's happening because the kind of things that you're mentioning ufuk you actually need really good data in terms of in terms of the ta- i mean both in terms of the distribution of talent etc cetera, etc cetera. okay on state owned enterprises state owned enterprises tend to be the least least transparent of the lot so i was actually talking with a chinese delegation right yeah so um so uh, uh, they were saying that that actually their state owned enterprises are fantastic okay <laughs> they are good they actually run. <laughs> so i asked so i asked them i said tell me this uh, do you think so you know say that you have uh, say that you have that uh, say that you have a state owned enterprise that was run by the democratic party okay would you invest in it i'm talking about the us right would you invest in a company that was run by the democratic party would you invest in a company that was run by the republican party okay. why would you invest in a comp- why would you invest in a company that was run by the communist party okay and many of them agreed with me until uh, until they realized that this was a dangerous thing to agree to right? <laughs> <laughs> but but i think part of the problem is exactly this now where the state owned enterprises are actually likely to stymie progress the most is actually in the energy transition because they dominate the energy sectors all the public utilities and if you look for example fossil fuel fired energy and so on all of that is actually dominated by state owned enterprises if you look at renewables especially the new thing it's all dominated by the private sector you have a chart right there right yeah, yeah. so they all dominate I think this is the case where those charts that you have where you have a big incumbent mm. pushing back against technological progress against smaller uh, s- 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 smaller new entrants this will be the place with because these SOEs as Poonam just mentioned I mean state owned banks and so on they're very powerful they're very close to the government now in the case of in now but but even here you actually find that there are governments who actually end up missing opportunities so for example you know china we feel actually has been missing the opportunity to mainstream the sort of institutions that you have in hong kong to actually import those institutions it's easier to import those institutions and so on in fact china is going away from that right and so as a result of it I think that this whole thing about economic freedom which we think is very important for this final stage because this economic freedom I know I'm going to have to wrap up yeah um but but, uh, but 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 you know you have to have economic freedom because at the stage that at the stage that these countries are when they uh, 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 when they actually get closer and closer to the frontier the way that they get new ideas the way that, involves the movement of real people they have to come back so the streets of beijing have to start to look like the streets of washington where you have people from all over the world the streets of shanghai have to look like the streets of new york where you have people from all over the world and if the direction is the other way around then what's going to happen is that that final transition is not going to happen because a large part of this involves the actual movement of people back right i'm going to shut up Thank you. thank you very much in the mid and thank you to in the mid to ufuk to punam very thoughtful ideas but very problematic ones <laughs> but i don't want to leave you depressed <laughs> uh later in the spring the world bank will publish the world development report 2024 called the middle income trap where we not only cover the problems but point to ways countries can make these transitions from middle income to high income and 
I think these are kind of just the curtain raises for the ideas. And I'm very excited that with Ufuk and the University of Chicago, the World Bank will be doing country specific studies. And thanks to Poonam for being one of our first partners to do this in India. And we will explore these details, not only at the global level, but country by country. So much more to come. And thank you all, of, thanks to all of you for being here for 90 minutes and participating. Thanks everyone. Thank